Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel called Sonata Reacts where I learn all things hard with your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view and in today's video we are going to look into the review show. I know you guys all like it and the topic is going to be uh, one of the guys that is very famous uh, apparently over there uh, you'll discover in a second because uh, it's a very challenging for me to repeat his name. Um, um, but uh, the video is going to be about uh, the Indian political truth. And I mean, we do a lot of geopolitics here and I obviously do not understand the context as much. Uh, so it will be very interesting for me to to explore. And apparently he speaks the the, the truth. So I'm, I'm actually very curious what I'll learn. Now, before we jump into the video, I want to say that this video is, uh, this Ranveer podcast is very long. It's two hours long and I'm going to do only two episodes. And the thing is, I know that you guys want me to do those podcasts, but then I don't feel like they're being as watched. Uh, so I'm definitely going to increase the speed to 1.5 uh, because I know some of you are complaining, but here is the reason why. Obviously, um, it takes a long time for me to shoot, a long time for you to watch. Uh, so we just have to find a compromise somewhere in between. With that being said, uh, let's go and check the video. But before we do, please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, let's do this. Let's see. I'll try to cut it off around an hour mark. How we get on. I want to talk about politics, geopolitics Absolutely. with you, but now you left me with aliens. A <laughs> <laughs> lot of aliens are in politics, by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Ooh, okay. <laughs> Only Jay Sai Deepak and you, I feel a lot of all the guests I've ever had on my show are probably capable of doing this. Jay, Jay Sai is amazing. And uh, disclosure, he is representing me in one of, the, one of the cases. What are you sued for? For uh, my freedom of speech. Contempt, criminal contempt of court. Uh, Damn! <laughs> for being you. <laughs> for being me. Why should I bore you with this intro and explain to you who Anand Ranganathan is? He's in the same league as the Jay Sai Deepaks of the world, the Abhijit Chavras of the world, and the Rajiv Malhotras of the world. He's on the Ranveer Show for the first time today. He's one of our country's most respected political commentators. Lots of extreme right-wing people believe that he's left-wing. Lots of extreme left believe that he's a right-wing guy. But honestly speaking, after interacting with him on the podcast, I know that he's one of the most centristy people that I've come across. I'm not going to say too much more. Enjoy this centrist style conversation of TRS. I've never been someone who's been into political conversations until this phase of my life. When I've realized there's a way to make these fun with humor, with simplicity, and with ease. Anand Ranganathan with a blockbuster episode of TRS. Here we go, baby. <laughs> Anand Ranganathan, sir, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much, Anand, for having me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, welcome to TRS. I also welcome the little cult you've built on the internet to <laughs> TRS. Uh, how have you been able to build this kind of a cult fan following? <laughs> I don't know about that. I just enjoy what I do, and I think that's uh, perhaps that's the secret, and that's that's the secret that you are in the know of as well. So you have you have probably a uh, hundred times a bigger cult following than anybody else. <laughs> no, my cult so, will meet your cult today <laughs> over this conversation. Uh, the clash of the cults. Oh, I, I don't know if it's a clash as much as it is <laughs> not at all. A new age Genghis Khan kind of thing. <laughs> what, what was that? Um, Lovely, one of the greatest episodes in the Game of Thrones, the Battle of the Bastards. Oh, <laughs> no, not that. There is still an <laughs> No, no, no. I welcome this, you know, like uh, maybe like a long lost brother of yours, Jaisai Deepak, was on the show. Yes, I know. I, I saw that wonderful episode. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's a bro off camera, oh, okay, yes. in terms of his energy, he's very brotherly. Yes. He has a sense of humor. It's just that on camera, he turns into a bit of a, a <laughs> demonic version of himself, which I love. I think he's able to build his cult out of that. So, yeah. uh, Bato, I called him dude, I called him bro. Yes. And people are just pissed off that I humanize guys like y'all. Because <laughs> y'all are like uh, demigods <laughs> are nice. for your cults. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a well-earned uh, title, which is why I will talk to you as a brother as well, Bilkul. Uh, if you don't mind. Absolutely, as my elder brother. Yeah, uh, don't uh, mind the inappropriate humor. Uh, don't mind the sharp question either. <laughs> so let's begin with a Bilkul. what's up in life. What's up in life? Life's good. Life's good. Uh, I'm enjoying whatever I uh, want to do. And I think that's that's what I love doing. That's, yeah. that's what I think should be done. Before every podcast, I do a little bit of research. I yeah. go around asking people, you know, about, oh, I'm getting this person tomorrow. What do you think? There was a lot of, oh my God, when I took your name. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that? So? Was that, uh, oh my God, as in don't do that or? No, no, it's I like see. a wow. Oh, I see. It's <laughs> like a, such a reputed man on your <laughs> show. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, how do you introduce yeah. yourself to a 10 year old in uh, Britain comes up to you and says, good sir, what do you do? How would you describe your job profile? So you want me to do the Julia Roberts thing? I'm just a simple guy. It's <laughs> <laughs> a Notting Hill reference. <laughs> yes. Wow. No, I mean, I'm just, um, I actually, I'm a, a simple, fun loving guy who really loves uh, whatever he wants to dabble in. And I, I would like to see myself as um, uh, a jack of all trades and master of none. 
okay because um, my bread and butter is of course science and i've if there's one thing i've learned being in being a scientist it is that you can never be an expert in any domain of science you can at best be a student mm. and uh, mm-hmm. i think that's uh, science gives you a lesson in humility you know and i think that's the biggest lesson and if i can um, this is a free flowing conversation sure. right so oh my I, god you know what my just the thought when he said that i was like what a humble man and then he says this is a lesson in humility love that love this guy right away ah let's go can go very well connect neurons as in whenever these yeah so and the biggest example of that uh, and we is that uh, 100 120 years ago uh, when during the time of darwin and you know uh, wallace and uh, other people when people started mm-hmm. thinking about biology and evolution they they would draw what is called the tree of life which is all the organisms that they know of the species and genus and everything and they'll put uh, you know uh, where are they placed in a kind of a metaphorical tree so you would have bacteria you would have fungi you would have apes you would have you know tiger other animals and all those things and uh, if you look at the tree of life of the the late uh, 19th century 1880 something like during the time of darwin you would see man is sitting on top of the tree of life that is what the perception was you know mm. if you see the modern tree of life man is barely hanging on to a branch which is one of 6000 branches you know mm. so and that has happened without science dictating to you that look this is what you must believe in no science just puts things on the table it's up to you to believe it or not and uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the single most biggest lesson that science has taught in the last biology and for for that matter physics as well is humility that you are no one you know mm. nothing matters and yeah. you thought you were sitting on the top of the tree and now you're barely hanging on to a branch mm. and uh, one other thing that i feel which is really surprising is that of all the attributes that we put to human imagination you know that oh we can imagine great and we are amazing at imagining things why is it that all aliens have two ears and two eyes and one nose and four limbs are bhai you know so and but that is so psychological because we we see everything else as emanating from the human thought you know mm-hmm. so we also believe aliens also would be like us you know mm-hmm. kind of very evolved and uh, so do you believe in aliens uh, i believe that they would definitely be there somewhere because there is uh, 100% a possibility of life okay. outside of earth no doubt about it mathematically but speaking mathematically speaking and the fact that now we know so much more as to how life originated on earth and that mm-hmm. that whole process has been nearly replicated uh, uh, you know in the laboratory so why wouldn't it be replicated somewhere else you know where the uh, the whole atmosphere or the conditions are conducive so okay i love that we brought up aliens so early in this conversation <laughs> you know it's a meme related to the show <laughs> oh, really? uh, the meme is tera career gaya bhar mein pehle ye bata aliens hote hain ki nahi <laughs> uh alien uh, bhau hmm. yeti bhaiya and uh, bhoot didi <laughs> so those are the three memes associated with the show uh all right i want to talk about politics geopolitics with you but now you left me with aliens i know <laughs> lot of aliens are in politics by the way oh really really <laughs> Ooh, okay what pisses you off the most about modern day india about modern day india ah uh, that's such a complicated question uh, i think uh, more than the opportunities it is the missed opportunities you know and i think that that is what pisses me off that we can do things we are in a position to do things we are in a position to do things right do the right things and yet we don't through political expediency or you know some other things corruption and things of that sort um but at the same time you know there's the glass is always as they say you can either see it as half empty and half full uh, it's always easier to see it as half full you know that is what politicians would uh, politicians always see it as half full because that is what they want to project you've never heard a politician who's fighting for re-election saying oh things are so awful things are so bad <laughs> you always see the opposition doing that right opposition points out the mistakes um and the people who are in government they point out what good they have done hmm. but just imagine if they were to do the other way around you know i i think that would be a much more fruitful conversation i would like the opposition to sometimes acknowledge the government has done good things i mean of course you see around them you see great things have happened and i would like the government to acknowledge the horrible things or the mistakes that have happened you know it's, it's always uh, so depending upon the government or the opposition they they look at the glass which is half full or half empty very yeah. interesting perspective that will never happen <laughs> <laughs> that will never happen in the last 10 years i have never seen the opposition commending uh, modi on anything which is very strange even on for example fit india you know uh, they did not comment on that even on swachh bharat making more toilets in fact some of them went on to say that uh, toilet should not be made because they're taking away the bonding time of females when they used to go to the fields at 6 o'clock in the morning so, <laughs> but that's the story with uh, when bjp was in opposition you mm-hmm. know upa did a lot of good things uh, in their 10 years uh, and i never saw bjp perhaps mm-hmm. once or twice commend the upa but other than that never you know uh, you agree that we live in a time of polarizing opinions i love polarizing opinions and polarized opinions as well yes like yes. it's a polar world yes, we're either on this side or that side i call it we are all bipolar <laughs> <laughs> including the earth yeah. which is <laughs> my, my my big hope is that uh, honestly long form conversations and this is pretty much the only medium i want to say shit like research papers and all but right. people my age don't read uh, as much as people your age did when you all were my age <laughs> that but, was the only thing to do then you know so yeah. uh, I, my hope is that long form conversations like this help people land up on a shade of gray mm-hmm. rather than thinking that the government is black or white or the opposition is black or white uh, i don't know if people will honestly in this lifetime yeah. because oh, by the way I, i mean i for one i don't like gray i i'm a black and white guy yeah, yeah. why because i think gray allows you to be a hypocrite and gray allows you to pick and choose 
Yeah. I, I think you're already being grey a little bit, honestly, by yeah. just acknowledging mm-hmm. that the UPA uh, did something positive and that the Modi government has its own negatives, mm-hmm. and then you highlighted the positives on this side and the negatives on that side as well. Mm-hmm. That's grey by itself, but I'm curious to know why you say that you're not grey. So, I mean, for example, um, let, let let us take some historical figures. Sure. So they say some people say, oh, Tipu was fantastic because he gave some money to a mutt for the temple to be rebuilt. So, at the same time, they do not say how barbaric Tipu was when uh, you know he went along uh, demolishing some say 800 temples and he killed and converted so many hindus and christians and if you read his manifesto he says uh, you know conversion of hindus and, and deaths to the infidels is our sacred duty and all that but so you see one person saying oh let's ignore all that because he gave money to the mutt i think that's great you are picking and choosing a characteristic for example what if tomorrow i say look that's a wonderful uh, watercolor by hitler isn't that wasn't he a fantastic painter you know or i say look mao did pretty uh, you know quite a lot of good things plus he was a good poet as well ignoring the fact that he mm-hmm. killed 63 million of his own people you know and he's on the currency map same with churchill churchill won us the war at the same time do you ignore the fact that he's directly responsible for the murder of 4 million bengalis i mean indians in the bengal famine or you know he was the first one to uh, uh, deploy force gene gas and uh, out and out racist imperialist so gray allows you to uh, you know hop yeah. on plays like you know used to play statue hopscotch mm. so aaj aap is circle mein uh, square mein hai kal aap us square mein and politicians love the gray love the gray aap koi bhi example and no one is immune to it you look at for example uh, a government that believes in capitalism suddenly elections come and they will start doing i mean modi sarkar is actually it's a communist uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know economy and thinking of uh, uh, you know finance and all it is a left wing sarkar really you know? yeah i mean just day before yesterday they gave 90000 crores to bsnl that should not exist because uh, uh, you know it was narendra modi and that's one of the things that endeared me to him in 2013 he said a government has no business to be in business he said it he said it in 2013 2015 2018 and 2022 government and in the last 9 years all this government has done is to be in the business of running businesses <laughs> other than air india you know but you can see government he's absolutely right he was right uh, you know government cannot run businesses okay. cannot because it's it, it is based on competition you know mm. um you will not be able to uh, for example survive in a government system if for example there was a podcast which is i mean doordarshan let's take doordarshan do you think doordarshan would be able to compete with uh, private channels if it was not uh, you know uh, given so much of funding by the government mm. so it's it's like that uh, so but that's gray right because modi is saying one thing that government should not do businesses and at the same time he is his government is doing businesses what's the intention with doing business for the government okay can i just stop right here because i i <clears throat> don't want to forget so it's very it, it was very interesting for me to see that he's like he said black and white but i feel like he means black and white perhaps <clears throat> in government context now i think in a swami vivekananda video uh, i have said like i don't i i'm i think more like the randy guy i believe in shades of gray i don't think everything is black and white i feel like there are certain things that over time become obvious that it was the right thing and then it was like a bad thing but like what is bad and right right like no one is inherently good or bad he was trying to paint a picture like uh, i mean like uh, that was so sure to hitler yes overwhelming quality of there perhaps wasn't that great right but if you will just say uh when so sure chill for you guys he's been great uh, great bad but for the western world he has been good you know uh in in many different aspects so this is why i don't appreciate black and white because nothing is ever black and white um i think he's just thinking of particular concept uh, me as a spiritual person i yeah i, I completely and based on how the world works it doesn't work that way because we have to if everything was just like perceivably good there is nowhere to go nowhere to evolve right and right now we are as a species um evolving and for that you need to have the contrast right without that there is just like what what are we even doing here right discussing even even this so this is i really don't agree with him is it to fund political campaigns is it to make the government richer by itself is it to make the country richer what's the one layer deep intention uh, it's basically to win elections because freebies and this is a complete uh, misnomer that only uh, aap aam aadmi party aur kejriwal is involved in giving freebies in fact i have a, a running thread where i've listed out the freebies given by every political party bjp has possibly given more freebies than any other political party uh, for its and its students watching this you have to give some context on what freebies yeah means. so freebies are like you know you give doles like uh, free electricity or uh, free water um free uh, trips to senior citizens you know mm. things of that sort everything is free okay now but you see when people ask me should freebies be given or not now that's a difficult question because a country like india you need to be a government needs to be a welfare state otherwise people will die by their millions for example in covid the government needed to give 80 crore people two meals a day which it has been and it has continued that 
the government needs to give free education. It needs to give free health insurance, you know, things of that sort. Perhaps not, you know, for the long term going. Well, it doesn't in the US. They don't get uh, free, you know, anything pretty much. It's hardcore capitalism, but they're trying to be social in here. So I don't know. Forward 50, uh, 20, 30, 40 years. But so I have, I am a proponent of welfare state. What I'm not a proponent of is the money that is coming uh, to the government to um, make sure that this welfare state exists and prospers. That money cannot come from socialism. That money has to be generated through capitalism. A welfare state is possible only in a capitalistic world, not in a socialist world. You mean to say that instead of them running their own businesses, yes. rather have actual businessmen, businesswomen run businesses? And you businesses? tax them. You okay. tax them and you get like what America does. You know, okay. like so. You, uh, for example, if we had huge conglomerates like what America does, and we tax them uh, nominally, not like you know, uh, basically squeeze the life out of them, which is what India does. Because you need uh, you need money to run things, you know. You, you just can't keep on printing money like America does. Uh, America is in debt of what 25, 30 trillion dollars, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, just a week ago they were about to go into uh, you know so-called quote unquote bankruptcy or something, but it's always saved at the last moment. Uh, India will not be saved if we reach that situation. Bangladesh is currently in that situation. Pakistan has been for so long. Sri Lanka was. So this kind of you know keep on running debt is a very risky business because we can't like uh, America. We can't keep on having this what they call helicopter money, keep on printing money. You know we we just can't do it. But the fact of the matter is, governments cannot run businesses. And out of, so myself and a very young economist, uh, Karan Basim, very gifted guy, we wrote an article last October uh, about public sector units. So India has, uh, we tabulated, it wasn't very easy at all. Uh, we had to look at all the government uh, kind of activity reports uh, from finance uh, ministry, all those things. So uh, the bottom line is India has about 1830 odd public sector units, central and state. 400, about 400 of them are non-functional, but still government is paying money. You're talking at a very high level here. This is a podcast where I call students. Uh, no, no, okay. so, so, so public sector units are like public sector banks, like State okay. Bank of India. Um, uh, Navratnas are an example. Uh, uh, ONGC. Is an, so all, they would know. I mean, let's let's dial back slightly. Sure, just course. to kind of conclude what you said. Right. right? So you're saying so that government should not run businesses. But but what specifically within that pisses you off? Their lack of ability to run businesses? Okay. Unable to sack people who are, uh, you know, not contributing anything. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Non-competitiveness. Uh, I gave the example of Doordarshan. You know, uh, if it is non-competitive, it is doing some things that, uh, don't sell, but you keep on, uh, you know, having it just because it is a kind of a propaganda or a broadcasting machine for you. So, like, likewise, state banks as well. Okay, you so know, nationalized you're banks. You're saying the mechanism of those businesses created by the government. There's yes. a lot of lazy people who make money through of corruption course, yes, and yes. Uh, a lack of their own abilities. Yes. But they're like, oh no, we work with this particular yes. government organization, yes. and overall, that government organization doesn't perform as well as a private organization Absolutely. could in its place. Yes. And you know, it, basically, mm -hmm. to give you an example, uh, we used to have in in our refrigerators and air conditioners. Okay. Before he jumps into the example, it's just always very hard for me to know where to to cut when I want to say something. I just wanted to add that I think it's not just specific to India. I, I totally love what he's saying. I, I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. I do think governments cannot run businesses I, uh, for the exact same reasons that he has. I, I think it's a glo perhaps global phenomenon, but let's continue. Uh, chlorofluorocarbons until it, it came out that they're very harmful <laughs> because they deplete the ozone layer and then CFCs were banned. Mm. As late as two years ago, the government was funding a, a, a PSU, public sector unit, that was its job supposedly was to make chlorofluorocarbons. Okay, they outdated. That, that, that was banned in the late 80s. Mm. But the public sector unit existed because people had to be paid their salary. So likewise, there are so many, so many companies mm. that the government is just simply, uh, you know, paying money to uh, because it doesn't want to, uh, you know, end those things. Air India is a great example of that. What business is it of uh, the uh, government to run in airlines? So if they just shut off all these businesses, yes, yes. you're basically saying that a lot of corruption will yes. go away from the country. Yes. So your actual... Uh, point of being pissed off here is the corruption that all this enables. Corruption and the kind of uh, image that it generates that, you know, you can mm -hmm. you can earn money okay. without contributing anything, without being profit making, without, uh, you know, being responsible for taking the company higher, mm -hmm. uh, without inventing stuff. I mean, it's, it's the antithesis of uh, Darwinian evolution okay. that is based on survival of the fittest, empathy, as well as uh, competition. Okay. You know? When this exact point is brought up to PM Modi. Yes. What do you think him and his team think? Because I'm sure someone would have brought this of up. Of course, yes. That, yeah, there's so much corruption through yes. all these businesses. Yeah. What do you think his or their defenses and why is it still running? Yeah, so the first action would be that somebody would get up and open the window and the person who suggested this would be thrown out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the second one would be, how will you win the election? The person you are sacking, he will not vote for you. And there are millions of people, millions of employees in loss-making units. Ke. They are not going to vote for you. Their children are not going to vote for you, you know. And the, the prime example, let me give you an example how socialism and this kind of warp thinking wins elections. Uh, you've, uh, and uh, this generation, as you now you made me very conscious as to how to... No, 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 please don't be conscious. Uh, okay, so there is something called the old pension scheme and yeah. the new pension scheme, yeah. right? So the old pension scheme uh, was uh, ordered to be looked at by the Congress government. 
and in fact dr manmohan singh who's an economist very well known economist in fact he's a wrangler which is incredible he's a very rare entity that uh, got two if i'm not mistaken two firsts from cambridge university he's almost impossible so he's a very gifted guy so dr manmohan singh and his associate uh, dr montek sigalwalia were asked to look at this and they came up with this new pension scheme and slowly all the states realized that look the old pension scheme is going to make the states bankrupt we have to revert to something new because the old one was putting the onus on new younger taxpayers you know and that's just unfair and there were so many other things that were wrong with it so by uh, 2018 2019 most of the states had replaced their old pension scheme to new pension scheme now what did congress do in himachal pradesh it said we will revert to old pension scheme congress wanted to go back on its own pension scheme because it wanted to placate a vote bank of retired old generation people or the whoever it and they won the election and they reverted to the old pension scheme they junked their own policy and in fact montaigne singh alwalia went on record to say the biggest revery ie freebie is this old pension scheme don't do it but yet congress did it they won the election and the repercussions of that is that every state now wants to revert to the old pension scheme chatisgarh i think is already reverted punjab which is an aap rule state still has reverted 15 lakh maharashtrians went on strike demanding that uh, the state revert to old pension scheme which when you look at from a macro perspective is yes. terrible for young people disaster being disaster because 80% of the revenue that a state like himachal generates will go on Ooh. into propping up this old pension scheme. rather than building infrastructure yes, so, rather than helping protect the environment but election jeet gaye congress okay yeah. let's for a second and i'm not defending them at all but let's for a second humanize a politician's career both okay. a bjp yeah. a politician and an anti bjp mm-hmm. politician a mm-hmm. uh, political career has two parts to it one yes. is win the election second yes. is be in power and then govern policy uh, know how to run the country or the state etc yeah. uh most people would uh be very concerned with this whole getting into power mm. um phase of their career yeah and that's what actually leads them to uh, taking decisions like this which may not benefit the uh, country or yeah. the state in the long term but will get them in power correct okay is this the dark truth about a political career sometimes you have to do what's wrong for the country in order to selfishly gain advantage yourself and then maybe correct it later uh, it's not i won't even call it uh, dark truth and it is the only truth and but if it's the only truth it will never change uh the electorate have to decide i mean you look at for example european country i know you can't extrapolate 1.4 billion people population of india to let's say uk or uh, nordic countries you know ki wahan pe uh, election ke mudde kya hain you know uh if you do that then you would realize the politicians would have to for example hamare desh mein tomorrow uh, during election the politician says so many things he is never held accountable hmm. ye free wo free be karnataka mein aapne dekha you know itna sara wo chal raha hai in uk if you say it the very next day he is forced to explain where is the money going to come from you say we'll do this free we'll do this free people just don't believe the politician they say well where is the money mm. you you simply not going to do it mm. so uh, you will go in debt and then you know it's basically that vicious cycle but the fact of the matter is the problem comes not in ideologically agnostic policies for example nobody will have a dispute as to we need we need to construct more toilets i mean pagal yoga jo kahega yaar aap highways bana rahe ho galat kaam kar rahe ho toilet bana rahe ho galat kaam cylinder de rahe ho up ne bhi kiye the bjp bhi kar rahi hai bjp ki pace is just incredible so that's that's the only difference is not that uh, you know congress didn't do it congress did it but the, it's just Uh, I don't know I mean uh, Nitin Gadkari is possibly an alien you need to get him on your show yeah <laughs> he is doing things that are just unheard of i mean no politician can even dream of the kind of things you know he's made uh, what we did in 70 years a fellow has done it in like so many things in the last 10 years it's just unbelievable what would you have me ask him um uh, okay that's um, how has he survived as a politician without uh, uh, you know thinking about winning elections mm. without because let's be very honest congress did a lot uh, for karnataka BJP has done even more in terms of infrastructure for Karnataka. I have the figures. I have this thing, and yet it lost the elections. So doing a lot does not translate into winning elections. Why? Interesting. Because we are still a cylinder, pani, bijli, sadak population. As in, your vote will go in the direction yes. of where you feel yeah. the amenities are coming from. Yes. And I don't, I don't begrudge that at all. Yeah, मेरे पास अच्छा स्कूल नहीं है अपने बच्चों को भेजने के लिए. मेरे पास हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस नहीं है. मैं अभी भी खाना बनाता हूँ. मैं वो फूक फूक के वो बनाता हूँ. ठीक है. Which is reason for you know millions of deaths. Household pollution is by the way one of the biggest, the biggest reason for infant mortality. People don't even know this. So उज्ज्वला के लिए जो मुझे वो सब देगा. मैं उसको इमीडिएटली वोट करूंगा या जो कह रहा है मैंने आपके लिए ब्रिज बना दिया है ये राजीव सेतु और 25 साल तक आपका फायदा होगा इसमें इट्स लाइक अ चॉक एंड चीज थिंग आई वोंट इवन थिंक यू नो सो यस ऑल दिस इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इज ग्रेट फॉर द कंट्री फॉर द मीडियम टर्म एज वेल बिकॉज इट जनरेट्स एम्प्लॉयमेंट ए डायरेक्ट एम्प्लॉयमेंट बिकॉज यू आर एम्प्लॉइंग लैक्स ऑफ पीपल इन मेकिंग ऑल दैट इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर प्लस बिकॉज ऑफ द इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर यू क्रिएटिंग सो मेनी जॉब्स इन सो मेनी सो इट हैज टू हैपन फॉर आवर डेवलपमेंट प्रॉब्लम वहां पे आती है जब लीप फ्रॉगिंग चाहिए होती है आपको वहां पे हम मैं ये आई विल पुट इट कि एवरी गवर्नमेंट बिकम्स एंटी नेशनल एक्चुअली एंटी नेशनल बिकॉज उनको दिखता है कि यार आप तुम 20 साल के के आगे सोच रहे हो मैं जीत जाऊं पहले इलेक्शन ये ट्रेजिडी है देख डाउन दिस थॉट ऑफ लीप फ्रॉगिंग एंड एंटी नेशनल ओके सो फॉर एग्जांपल लेट्स लेट्स टेक द फार्म बिल्स ओके द फार्म रिफॉर्म्स यू हैव टू गिव कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑन ऑल दीस थिंग्स आई डोंट अज्यूम दैट एनीवन नोस एनीथिंग नहीं 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 एब्सोल्युटली सो बेसिकली एज एवरीवन नोस 2 इयर्स अगो आई थिंक इट वाज 2 एंड 1/2 इयर्स अगो मोदी डिसाइडेड टू ब्रिंग इन दीस 3 फार्म बिल्स the first one uh, it happened quite long ago so let me see if i can recall what exactly these farm bills were sure. first one was that we will give the farmers a choice 
where they can sell their produce. So up till now, the farmers have to go to a government mandi, which is called APMCs, Agriculture uh, Produce Marketing Committee. So government has made its mandi, it's a socialist system. There will be a farmer, there will be a farmer, there will be a farmer. Modi said that you can actually sell your produce wherever you want to. The second was we will do away with something where the government could immediately come and say that, uh, look, now we are going to, you are holding stuff. uh this is you cannot hold stuff anymore so uh this was a, this is an essential commodity and that was devastating because uh, you know no go down maker would actually make go down so what used to happen is a farmer produces something in the western countries you can store it up to 6 months a year right and then enter the next agricultural produce cycle and then you, so for 6 months to a year you don't have to worry about the perishability or perishing of your produce you know it's in go down yahan pe kya hota tha ki aap you know here what would happen is you make a go down the farmer stores it and suddenly the government executes this essential commodities act and uh, let alone say that you can't hold quote unquote hold is a very negative connotation you can't put store stuff in godowns people would be arrested so no businesses would enter making these state of the art godowns so farmers were forced to sell immediately what whatever they produced you know um and the third was to bring in contract farming which is that if a business organization like the andani or the ambani's want that the farmer to produce this crop cash crop instead of wheat or rice or something they you know contract uh you contact a farmer and enter into a contract and the farmer grows that for them these were the three things this would have catapulted india into a middle income economy by that i mean 15000 dollars per capita gdp right now we have our is 2000 dollars gdp per capita within a span of a decade or perhaps more and the tragedy was that each of these three reforms were in the manifestos of all opposition parties more draconian the these three were not only in the manifesto of the congress party the congress party said we will do away with apmc at least modi was giving a choice the farmer can at least go to a private mandi or an apmc congress and nahi apmc is archaic do away with this and punjab that was at that point of time ruled uh, governed by the congress party had already started the contract uh, uh, you know the the whole act in fact amrinder singh who was the uh, chief minister of uh, congress uh, punjab government had entered into a contract with the ambani's uh, i think it was a, a 6000 crore contract and the businesses a lot of other business houses were contracting the farmers to produce whatever but the mo- moment modi brought in these things congress you know you know what happened congress called them kale laws there were these protests for more than a year they blocked the highways they you know there was like lakhs of crores of money was just completely uh, you know destroyed economy was destroyed all those businesses that were around those highways you know each day they were losing 3000 crores people died and the worst thing was that after all those farm bills were repealed by modi that alone was a anti national decision because he didn't give any reason for that uh, if i was a farmer in america i would have sued the government you know because in america you have this class action suit you just can't take an arbitrary decision because your decisions affect my well being my prosperity so you can't this government can't say oh we take those farm bills back you know if you promise something that is going to make me prosperous and you renege on that promise i should be able to sue you because you know aap, uh, you don't lose anything i am losing my health and prosperity and well being you know so um, and what happened was these anti national uh, opposition parties they won and uh, the modi government took this anti national decision to repeal the farm laws that is what is called leapfrogging just these three things and i ask you a very simple question you are a, a, a the next gen a present gen amazingly uh, uh, you know uh, gung ho about optimistic about india you have a business you want to attract the audience rather than uh, you know privately rather than go to uh, a channel which is entirely government owned if you can do it why can't a farmer do it hmm. who the hell are you to tell the farmer that you should only go to a government marketplace to sell your produce it's like you know you create something and you say oh you can't go to amazon come to uh, sarkar pradesh committee uh, you know amazon like marketplace hmm. is it to hell with you hmm. when you can say it why shouldn't a farmer be farming is a business hmm. and that is the tragedy you see we have uh, more than 40% almost 44% of our ready labor force which is i think about 515 million indians is our ready labor force 44% of that is involved in agriculture which is crazy in western countries middle east uh, you know uh, middle income economy it's not more than 2 to 3% i mean this is a catastrophe it's not waiting to happen it has happened mm. 83% of indian households are directly involved in or you know they they are related to indian agriculture yeah. I have a couple of questions for you, which are completely unrelated because now we'll do a sharp pivot. Sure. Uh, first question: How do you retain so much data in your head, <laughs> Mr. Scientist, like Dr. <laughs> Scientist? Uh, the yeah. second question is: Are you not afraid that when you're talking so openly about uh, the criticisms that you have for the government, yeah. are you not afraid that one day two guys in black suits and black ties will show up at your door and shoot you or something? <laughs> <laughs> are you are you not afraid of that possibility? Uh, no, no, I'm not because. Uh... A, I'm a free speech absolutist. Okay. Number one. Oh wow. Uh, B, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, sayings is by uh, an amazing judge uh, called I think Giuseppe Falcone, Judge Falcone in Italy. He said, uh, "The one who is not afraid of dying dies only once." Mm. Mm-hmm. I think that's wonderful. You know, this is uh, people are scared of everything. They're afraid of dying, and they die ev- almost every day. Um, so I, and the the other fact of the matter is. that when people ask me in fact you didn't because uh, I, i really like your show and what you do you very frank and uh, you know there's, there's no censoring of any sort but people say sir are there any questions that are off limits they ask me generally ah. i say well uh, no as long as there are no answers that are off limits <laughs> you know so they are more worried about the answers that i may give than the questions yeah. that i may receive and why shouldn't i 
be able to take any question. I mean, it's a challenge for me. And I would defeat myself. I'll, I'll fall in my own eyes if, you know, I wouldn't want to answer any question, you know. Uh, but having said that, uh, I've said this before, people call me only once. They don't call me again. So I think uh, to give you a couple of examples, I think that all from the top of my head, uh, a very dear friend, uh, he was an R Rajasabha MP, no less. So he invited me for a one-day conference on dynasty being the scourge of Indian politics. It was a BJP-sponsored event. You and mean that to say that oh, the Gandhi family nah, is yes, ruining India? That's yes, the underlying absolutely. message. Okay. Okay. That was supposed to be the only underlying message. Okay. And in fact, it was inaugurated by uh, Mr. Dave Fadnavis, who's otherwise a very nice, pleasant guy. My turn, I, my turn came. Uh, so I took the first five minutes to take out the, to narrate the names of 94 BJP MPs and MLAs who are dynasts. As in their <laughs> thoughts of nepotism? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. So, um, you know, and th my, uh, my talk is the only uh, talk that wasn't loaded onto the YouTube, this thing. But it's fine, I have nothing. Ooh. And I've, I've met this gentleman, that is a wonderful person. He remains a good friend. His wife is even a, a, a more dearer friend than he is. Uh, wonderful people. But polit politicians have this compulsion, you know. And I think, uh, so obviously I've not been invited again, but that's great. It's, it, ha it has not in any way destroyed our relationship because I know this, this happens. Yeah. One other occasion, uh, it was on corruption. And it was, I think it was a Fiki event. I really can't remember where it was uh, or when it was a $5 trillion economy, I think it was and all that and why BJP is, is working so hard because it's not corrupt. So I gave out seven or eight instances where BJP is intensely corrupt. They didn't call me again. As recently as two months ago, there was, I think, a G20 event. Uh, I, I want to, you know, <laughs> I want to do this many times because people think, what are you doing? You know, they're calling you there. <laughs> but then I say, look, I, you know, this is what I believe in. And don't people want to hear the truth? Or even if I might be wrong, of course I'm wrong most of the time, you know. We're only fallible and uh, we're not the, um, we're not women. So we, we're wrong most of the time. I don't think you're wrong most of the time. I, I don't know about that. But I, at least, look, I, I, one of my, again, my favorite phrases is, uh, or uh, quips is by Bertrand Russell. He said, I don't believe to death. Um, uh, what I say, I'm paraphrasing, so I might be wrong. Uh, so he says, I might be wrong. So I, I, I okay, so he says, I wouldn't die for my beliefs. I might be wrong. Uh -huh. You know, science per se gives you this element of doubt at all times. I mean, you, the, the whole purpose of science is to reduce the, the doubt as much as possible, you know, but of course there are things where you have removed it hundred percent of the time in science, but mostly it is always 90%, 95%. So, you know, of course, everything I say comes with an element of doubt. I know it, but you know, I'm just saying things on the top of my head without making any logic or without any backing of, you know, a rationale or logic behind it. I think scientists, so, because of the nature of your job and therefore mind, are the right people to be able to express intense political opinions. And if they're wrong, first people to apologize. Mm. Like, it just happened two days ago that I, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, I think on the panel, uh, one Congress uh, person said uh, something about the banning of the document, the BBC documentary and the tax inquiries against the BBC happened uh, on the same date. I said, no, there was a three month difference, you know, span between the two. And another panelist corrected me and said it was not three months, but three week mm. difference. I apologize immediately. You know, I mean, why shouldn't I? If I'm wrong, I should be the first person to apologize. But to, to, to come back to this, the G20 event, I think it happened and it was inaugurated by, uh, I think, the honorable governor of a state. And um, my turn came and I said, this guy should be suspended for a month for what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> How did he react? Uh, he did not react very well. Uh, but there was applause around the... Uh, thing because he had said something which was so blatantly wrong. That, you know, I mean, viscerally you feel, yeah, kya you know, it's like, what's he saying? So he said, look, the killings that are happening um, and Hindus were being killed, he said killings are not happening because uh, of religion. I said, it's like saying terrorism has no religion. And so he was clearly wrong what he said, but uh, he was not made accountable to it. And here was a chance. I didn't even see it as a chance. I didn't even know it's going to be inaugurated by the governor. He was there and I, it just happened that that thought came into my mind. We were talking about Kashmiri Hindus and the genocide that was perpetrated against them. We were talking about all those things. And I said, if I was uh, the powers that be, I would have suspended this guy for a month. So that did not go down well. I think that was possibly the last G20 thing I'll be invited to. So uh, likewise, Ranveer, uh, is this going to be the last year? No, 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 <laughs> not at all. This is the first of many. Uh, uh, honestly, yeah. I would like to know what the mood of the event was after you came off stage. Did you say hi to him? Or say, no, he, I think he walked off. And then the repercussions for the uh, organizers were pretty drastic. And there were some people who didn't like what I said. Uh, you know, I'm sorry if they felt that way. But I, I say what I believe the truth was. And many people came to me and said, you, you did right. Because somebody should tell him that he's wrong when Hindus, uh, you know, in villages around even now Jammu, forget about the valley or, you know, near Srinagar, they look at the Aadhaar card and they find out if someone is a Hindu or a Sikh or a Jain and then target him. That happened, terrorists barged into a school and looked at the Aadhaar cards and they found a Sikh teacher and they murdered her. So do you think that's not happening because of religion? I mean, what are you talking about? So he was clearly wrong, except that nobody pointed that out to him before I did. So, uh, you know, what is wrong is wrong. Yeah, you know. Have you been on other podcasts? Yes, okay. yes. You should be on a lot more podcasts because someone like you needs to explain himself <laughs> yeah. in an expanded manner. Right, right. And I'll tell you why. Mm. Honestly, yeah. your branding, if someone has not seen anything about you, yes. has come out as extremely right-wing. And I don't right. know why. As I'm speaking to you, yes. I don't feel you're right-wing no, at all. I feel you're yeah, truly yeah. centrist and yeah. you have a moral compass which governs yeah. your I, I, I say it all the time, I'm from science. Ki se 
<laughs> and I think what you look down upon most yeah. is uh, injustice and yes. you know very rudimentary yeah. way of saying it. You look down upon evil. Someone yes. is causing yeah. harm to other human beings, yeah. violence to other human yeah. beings. You look down upon that as Absolutely. bad. But you're definitely not right wing in terms of you're not completely for the current government either. I think it's a very important conversation because you talked about we're living in a polarized time. You're absolutely right. And one of the things that this does to the psyche is you immediately throw labels at people mm. because mm -hmm. you are something. Even if you're not, you've been categorized. So people call me Sanghi earlier. I used to take Ambraj at that, but now I, you know, I say, "Okay, yeah, call me anything you want." Uh, but at some point, it is because of the complex they hold. They are something, and it's it's like that complex where if you have been categorized and you might even be that, you want to label the other person as that because then it becomes easier to battle. Mm. And this yeah. comes out clearly in why atheists are hated so much because it is easier for a believer to uh, you know converse with a believer than for a believer to converse with an atheist when you lose a debate you yeah. make the debate personal and yes. putting labels on someone is a part of making it personal so what is a label i mean what, what are the kind of labels that people throw about in today's times is left wing right wing you must have you know you've seen that everyone so so people brand me uh, as uh, right winger then uh, when i say something that is uh, you know against this government or uh, you know against the the whole perception of what right wing is mm. uh, then they ya to kuch log to they say yaar yaar ye to anand hai he is selling it thoda as there's a wonderful person called cool funny t-shirt uh, so, you know i call him a rascal a delightful person on twitter um, so he is also you know he criticizes uh, the government he he is actually is a uh, he's not a bhakt at all he's not uh, certainly not an unbhakt he started this chappan kranti sena you know when modi started saying i'm chappan chappan in chappan so he's kind of mocking it and the, this master stroke thing you know everything must have a reason modi ji kar rahe hain to you know soch samajh ke kar rahe hain you know all that kind of lot of things go into that you keep on explaining uh, reasoning and justifying all sorts of decisions that this government makes you know that so he says sahelenge thoda you know that that's the term that the meme there is anand keh raha hai sahelenge thoda otherwise i am branded you know oh, he's a commis uh, you know commie he's from jnu his true colors are coming out and he has pongi friends and all so i i take it now in the stride but then at at a level where people are not generally in the public eye right so people in the public i don't really to be honest with you they don't mind this categorizing people have categorized it till the fine but any youngster who's come to a public discourse he can get really upset if people throw these labels on him because i used to be in that situation 8 9 years ago because what happens is everything that you do is then seen through that lens yeah mm. so somebody is just let's say entered a a discussion that is happening has professed a point of view and is immediately branded right winger now it doesn't matter what his next views are going to be it will be it's coming from a right winger mm. you know yeah. and there are some people who are not left wingers there are some people who are left wingers and the people who throw these labels are those left wingers because they want others to also be identified pigeon holed into something mm. it is comforting for them mm. it validates their reality Va validate ki yaar hame isne pigeon hole kar diya isko bhi karenge na mm. they hate it when they can't pigeon hole someone mm. you know because it's it's like uh, they hate an atheist because uh, you know an or a darwinian atheist to categorize there are different categories of atheists as well communists also call themselves an atheist but they are basically cult cultists uh -huh. so it's a religion i mean karl marx is uh -huh. basically a religion you know they uh, and in fact marx uh, uh, hated darwin yeah, basically that's another matter uh -huh. but the fact of the matter is what is can be left wing or right wing it's very difficult to categorize it according to me i think the one that uh, the one definition we should really be worried about is something called social darwinian are you a social darwinian or not and i have seen in the last 10 years even before that when i have analyzed the things that have happened both the so called left wing and right wingers are social darwinian what is social darwinian is that is you project what is darwinism which is um, a combination of survival of the fittest adaptation to a new changing environment and empathy you kind of extrapolate it to a society and you start defining what is greater good right so for example if a, a, a communist says that uh, do not have um, dams right i am doing it for the greater good Mera Patka to take an example, Narmada Dam. So much happened. It was commissioned in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru commissioned the Narmada Dam, and Modi actually saw the completion of it, the raised height of it, went to Supreme Court. 20, 30 years we lost, and you know, right now what Narmada Narmada Dam is doing, it is uh, sending power to two million homes. It has irrigated 1.8 million hectares of land, and it has uh, supplied water to 30 million homes. And just on their whims and fancies. Uh, this lady uh, mera patkar said we won't have dams because it is for the greater good of humanity likewise so there, these decisions they say it's social darwinism mm. right and the whole uh, subjugation of species of civilizations was based on this social darwinism that we are fitter than you so it we have the guns you don't we have the right to kill you that is what that is how empires were built that is how spaniards went to latin america and murdered and annihilated civilizations that is how churchill gloated that the indigenous tasmanian population was decimated and the last tasmanian was actually filled uh, and you know at this taxidermy done on it and put in a museum churchill gloated well you know that's his fate what to do mm. that is social darwinism and both the right wing at times and the left wing at all times they indulge in this kind of mm. thing that is more harmful than right wing or left wing because to be honest uh, the the left or communism is against the spirit of darwinian evolution except one small subset which is called quorum sensing you know okay. but uh, the right uh, is 
it actually should follow darwinian evolution so what you're saying is basically when you think that your opinions are for the benefit of humanity yes. it actually stops you from deep diving into the debate the argument the discussion right. understanding the nuances of yes. it and then coming to a conclusion for example this government modi is called right winger right why is he called right winger i mean can you can you give me three examples of his right winger his uh, economic outlook is totally left wing state control even more state control laws very little reforms of regulation whatever reforms he wanted he has gone back on it when because of opposition pressure or whatever it may be so this economically this is a left wing government i'll tell you why yeah. he's called right winger because hindu is he yeah and <laughs> and we at least urban indians mm. reference what's happening in america right and there the right wing is primarily christian yeah. i believe yes so uh, the kind of parallel in absolutely. india would be uh, all the hindus for yes. example yeah. an urban hindu upper middle class man yeah. would be like the white boy of india yes. it's the same logic bilkul bilkul and if you if you look at like many people say are bhai right winger hai left winger hai kya hai isko sab main ko main science ki taraf se whenever in doubt just follow this you might not be right all the time i mean science isn't hasn't given you all the answers but the only quote unquote ideology or belief that has given you maximum answers reproducible answers is science what you're trying to say is your a fan of facts and you're a fan of the good of humanity are you a social darwinian no no no, no I'm, so i'm completely against social darwinism okay. i'm completely against social darwinism no, no, i'm 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 a darwinian through and through okay that is the thing all right it's a low level discussion now <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> after this uh, extremely deep uh, thought provoking discussion so just to add to that uh, sure. Ranveer, so uh, in in the uk you have conservatives right mm. now i'm against conservatism because science doesn't believe in conserving things you are constantly mutating you are adapting mm. if you i mean uh, we wouldn't be humans if apes were conserved mm. right <clears throat> so every species might think this is beautiful let me conserve it sorry nothing is perfect things are always evolving mm. and that is ironically the beauty of hinduism you look at our music you look at our dance forms they are constantly adapting you know and i say this all the time the beauty of Hindu, I, i know very little about a hinduism and even less about uh, you know hindustani classical music or indian classical music but what i do know is that one primary aspect of it being so beautiful is that nothing is written in stone i mean what beethoven wrote as his ninth symphony in 1827 somebody plays it today it would be exactly how how beethoven wanted it to be played because everything is written down right indian music is not like that you know it's oral it is adapting to you know maybe 80% of it is uh, what tansain played or even before that but 20% has been infused with you know ravi shankar has come up with something new kuch naya wo aaya kuch you know things are changing in carnatic music as well i mean what how tyagaraja uh, you know kind of uh, thought uh, you know the rendition should be it's not the same right now what that tells you is that hinduism its culture its art is almost completely mirroring darwinian evolution it is antithetical to the right wing conservatism mm. if it was conservative then everything would be the same as it was 2000 years ago mm. you know now you can say it would have been still be perfect but evolution by definition means there is nothing which is static we in the last one hour we've had a discussion we've evolved into something human evolution is constant it is happening all the time okay. you know they blunt uh, response to everything that you said up to this point which is that i feel stupid in front of you I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like and and honestly that does happen on the show a lot yeah. like because i get to meet people like yourself <laughs> but uh, the gap between uh, right. the knowledge yeah, levels never feels so much not at all no in fact i uh, one of the things that keeps me going honestly very very few things keep me going now with age of course uh, you know is that i want to learn i want to learn new things all the time and i'm constantly learning new things constantly and one of the biggest platforms that are, that has allowed me to do that meet people who are so much more brilliant than i am is twitter believe it or not you know mm. i have learned i have learned to to be discerning to take the good from twitter there's a lot of bad on twitter of yep. course because everyone has a mic now you know mm. and i'm all for it by the way even psychopaths <laughs> need a mic at some point or the other mm. you know uh, but the fact is you you need to constantly learn a because then it will allow you to be humble at all times and b it will enrich you in so many ways and i'll um, i'll just tell you just Three days ago, there was something that I wanted uh, for 15 years, and I found a way to get it. Uh, you know what it was? Uh, I can I can tell you. So this this was a sculpture by Salvador Dali, who was a surrealist uh, uh, painter, and he was profoundly uh, impressed by Sigmund Freud, who's a psychoanalyst. You know the birth of psychoanalysis is birth of psychology. That's right. Yes, and his interpretation of dreams. You know how he believed that you could actually cure people's uh, uh, you know uh, neurotic uh, diseases and all those things just by simply talking to them. It's an amazing concept. Um, and he made a sculpture. called the anthropomorphic cabinet and i always wanted that but before the advent of internet i had i heard about this and i uh three days ago i found out a marketplace where that sculpture or a replica of that is available mm. and all that replica i mean that sculpture is it has a woman uh, in nude and she's like her hand is up like that and she has these drawers her, her body is full of drawers and what dali wanted to say was that since the i can't remember the exact uh, uh, you know phrasing of his he said that uh, since the greek uh, civilization and the, the great epoch greek epoch the only other person who's impressed me is freud because he's shown me that the secrets of a woman these i e the secret drawers can only uh, the information in them can only come out through psychoanalysis <laughs> so can you imagine this he's, he's actually made a woman in the shape of these drawers cabinets imagine that you know you do psychoanalysis and a drawer comes out and the information of that woman comes out and he 
he took that thought further and he put put the same sequence of drawers on um i think Af aphrodite um so there's a very famous statue um in in the louvre museum of aphrodite a beautiful greek sculptor of uh, uh this lady, Greek lady called Aphrodite, and it was excavated and it was, of course, stolen from Greece and then brought to Louvre, and that's where it's there. <laughs> and he put these drawers on that. Now, you compare those two structures, uh, sculptures. One is the beautiful Aphrodite, um, uh, and the other is this Aphrodite with these drawers. Which one impresses you more? I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking of the thought process involved <laughs> that human beings have drawers, and all of us have drawers. Mm. We have secret drawers. We have, you know, various things. It's, it's just in the mind. Mm. So we think we know someone, and then suddenly don't we say, oh my God, I thought I knew that person, but that's not true. Mm. So psychoanalysis, knowing more about it, it's so utterly fascinating. And I wouldn't have known about this sculpture had I just completely, you know, parked away this thought and not been in constant search of something that can give me this thrill. So I, I love surrealism. I, I love people who are, uh, you know, who delve into that. What is surrealism? So, uh, okay. <clears throat> I am going to cut it here. Uh, there are just so many things that he has mentioned. So let's go this through this one by one. The guy, obviously, first time I'm seeing him, never heard of him. Um, seems super humble, super knowledgeable scientist, which is, I can see that he's a scientist in a, maybe through scientific um, point of view, I would have liked him to be perhaps for my own sake, and sorry, kicked my camera, um, a bit more spiritual, which, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting because a lot of people that actually are deep scientists, they they turn to spirituality, which I think at the bottom line is basically just understanding the science and the physics of this world. But <clears throat> regardless, uh, very, very, I mean, very enjoyable conversation that they, they, they've had and, and the information that he has revealed. One thing that I've noticed about him that he... I think is a lot of, uh, I don't, I wonder how you feel about it, but that's kind of how he comes across in this particular situation. But he's influenced a lot by the Western culture. He keeps on having, you know, the references that I personally understand. I wonder how you feel like I understand that there is um, kind of lack of psychology in, in, in India. Like it's not really a thing over there. And he now talks about Sigmund Freud and and all the, and the psychoanalytics. And, and these are like the topics very near and dear to my heart. Um, because I'm, I've been, you know, I've told to you that uh, for me, spirituality 20 years. And, and similarly, it is like personal development, self-growth, like psychology, all of these topics that I've been, you know, I, I would have my main life and then I have my spiritual and psycho personal development life next to it for decades now. Uh, so it is impressive that he is actually aware of that. And, uh, and the way he talks about the fact, that uh, psychologist is there and Sigmund Freud and all of that stuff. He refers to Salvatore Dali and all that kind of stuff. It makes me believe that, like, not not, not many people in India are aware of that. I might be wrong. Um, that's just the impression that that uh, he's giving. But uh, it's just interesting because it feels like he's a lot influenced by the Western culture, or maybe rather than Indian culture. But I'm totally wrong, right? So <clears throat> what I'm uh oh i liked about him and he i was trying to pause but the conversation was was going um when he was talking about labeling people and then further it flowed into the psychological conversation it is uh it really is true this is what i've kind of noticed even on this channel and he's validating a lot of my observations with the channel and um so, so what I mean by that is that a lot of people will just say, oh, this is a left wing on right wing. And then um, it is so incredibly hard, I think, for anyone to judge someone just from, let's say, a video or like a speech that he has given. I was thinking about it a lot because obviously you run a channel and you understand now i understand when celebrities have a brand management and, and pr and all of that kind of stuff because anything you do or say can be so vastly misrepresented and what he has said used for other narratives and you will be labeled things without this being completely not who you are completely another representation and even though the guy does not believe in black and white, which I feel like he should reevaluate, it's it's like we are not black and white. I have times in my life where I respond to things completely out of character. And I'm like, where is that even coming from? And 
to what the point that he is saying, he's like, we are constantly evolving. And so, for example, when you share a particular idea, in my head, it is interconnected with my experience, with my experience, you know, it, I, I see it like a big branch of three and there is a reason why I'm expressing that. And we as a people have the tendency to dismiss stuff just like that, you know? Uh, and even what he had mentioned, and even if you know a person, you actually do not know them. Like, like just, just try to really deeply think about, do you really know yourself? I don't think you do. I don't think anyone really truly does. This is why relationships are so uh, so hard, in my opinion, because you have two people struggling to figure what themselves out first, and they they their but <laughs> bumble bumbles, you know what what is what is the world like the the kind of uh, you know when you have the the thing of wool, you know you you're that like a ball of of a mess. And you're trying to figure each other out. It's 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 deemed to perhaps not work rather than work unless you do personal work and understand. I always say it's more important to understand who you want to be than who you are now, because then you can work towards the person and say, this is what I've perhaps been in the past. I don't like it. I don't hold these opinions anymore. So humans are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly complex animals. And then when you see people being labeled and even on this channel, like, all oh, right, wing like it. I'm like, you, you are just so ridiculous. It's beyond unbelievable. Like, uh, you know, you clearly don't watch my channel. You clearly never heard me talking about, I don't like politics. I just take a video as, you know, I, I deem like of, of interest. I don't look at it through the lens of politics. I don't care. I don't care. Right. But then there will be people they will try to put a narrative on you, just like perhaps what exactly is happening to this guy, which is exceptionally aggravating for, for someone because I'm like, you're talking about me. You don't know what you're talking about because you don't know me. Just because you think that I come on camera and express my opinions, you don't actually even understand where these opinions are coming from. And this is why I like this guy because what he's talking is talking about humility. And I feel like once you've evolved your capacity to comprehend how complex uh, everything is, then you will be, I feel like, a bit more humble in your approach, a bit more discerning. But everything is also relative. <laughs> it's it's very hard even for me to, to say that because it's just, I feel like the whole concept is so complex and I could talk about it for hours. Uh, but I, I guess the, the gist, what I'm just trying to say that uh, what when he said, like, it's just easier to label people. And in this world, and especially in the West, but it looks like perhaps in India as well, it is just so much easier to, to label someone like a right wing or left wing without trying to get to know the person. This, this kind of dehumanizes someone. And I feel like if society does not understand psychology, how we work, how we evolve, it will be very, very hard. Then I feel like we are a primitive species. We are truly primitive species. If we are unable to work on ourselves and if we are not able to have a constructive debate with one another. And yes, it you know, you might have different beliefs, I have a difference. We can be respectful of each other's beliefs and we can respectfully agree to disagree. I don't personally see anything wrong with that. But until like a majority of the humans reach that point and are evolved enough to understand that we all are complex beings and we constantly evolve um then we'll have we'll be stuck in the same narrative and uh, obviously that is perpetuated by media because be, media just needs a an easy victim it's it's very easy to manipulate people uh it's it's easy to to put out narratives and steer things as you wish so i I feel like us as a humanity should strive to be better. And this is why <laughs> I don't like politics. And this is why I like personal development, self-help, spirituality, because I feel like this allows you to do that, to be a better human. You don't have to be amazing human right now. And this is where the balance is always. We have, if you want to evolve, you have to have the if if I'm doing drawing analogy black or white, right? You have to have something quote-unquote, perceivably bad, to be able to evolve from that. If 
if we don't have that, why do we even exist? You know, everything is just hunky dory. We're on a uh, cloud number nine. We're all like hot and can, uh, cut, uh, uh, cotton candy and and unicorns and you know like uh, all kind of uh, pinky uh, dreamy stuff. This I don't believe. At least we live in this universe where this is realistic. Or I feel like it's it's as he has said, it's about evolution, and yeah, and I I feel like these are way more interesting topics and politics ever will be because imagine that we had people that are truly self-evolved, truly try to understand it, but you'd have to have them in all spectrum of politics. And I feel like people in politics in general are perhaps the most unevolved personally people because they're driven by ego and greed, but it's just my personal judgment, right? It's it. That's it. Right. And, um, you know, you might have a different, whatever. So uh, I'm just inviting uh, to, to think about it in more deeper terms. Now, um, another interesting thing that really hit me is um, it's just like what he had talked about when he said like people don't, uh, what, but don't, people don't want to hear the truth. He's, he's assuming what I have assumed most of my life, that people do want to hear the truth. Now, it's a yes or no. And in my experience, it's more than yes. And I've talked about this concept for quite some time because I've been in leadership roles and been managing really like huge teams of, you know, maybe 40, 60 people. Um, and in my experience, managing businesses and managing teams, it's more about people don't want to hear the truth than people want to hear the truth. But it can differ. Like I'm a person that wants to hear the truth. And this is why I would be perhaps very direct very maybe strong headed, uh, saying as this. Um, and I realized that's not the approach with people, <laughs> at least not in the Western world or in the UK where I used to work for most of my time. Um, I came to realize sadly that people don't want to hear the truth. Um, especially when you're in leadership position, they just want you to fix everything and told them everything is going to be all right. In fact, I came to believe that people just want to hear that everything is going to be all right and someone else is going to fix it for them which is a scary uh premise to be in um drawing on my previous point because you know like it's it's about the evolution like you know you as a leader in a in a certain business you have to you have to put up with so much crap literally so much crap it's it's perhaps the worst job that you can have. Um, and, you know, like you're sacrificing pretty much your life uh, for others. And this will never be appreciated ever. Because, because people think that if you're making 200 pounds more than them, uh, you, you are, you know, grossly responsible for everything. It's, it's bizarre. It really is bizarre. And it you know, to the state of things. Now there, there, there are people, and, and I feel like these people are not people that wants to work on themselves. That is, that is how I view it. Um, and I even compared notes with other people and that was their same experience, sadly, at least in here. I don't know about India, but then obviously I did come across people that actually want to hear the truth. Now the people that want to hear the truth actually appreciate people that tell the truth, right? That is the thing. Like, if you are a truth seeker, you just want to know. You just really want to know. And I came across people like that. But the majority of people don't, you know? And so, for example, this guy is going to be very much regarded for people that are like, just tell me how it is. And I will not take an offense. And that, to me, even signifies the fact that the person has done a significant work on themselves to be able to receive the information, even though it will not be delivered in a way uh, that they might like to hear or desire to hear. Uh, and it will not affect the sense of the cell. I feel like people that need to have things sugar-coated really need to work on themselves uh, because that, that just talks to the fact that um, they are they, their, their sense of integrity, they're fragile inside right? And on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with being fragile. It is just like, 
you know, you maybe need to work how to build a character or not, you know, like you are you, you can decide you want to either evolve or stay the same. And, you know, conservatism is saying the same, but uh, as he correctly mentioned, you know, everything in nature changes and evolves. That's actually the normal thing. So it is a lot of things in the world depend on the personal growth. And uh, people that take offense to saying things as they are, it's usually the people that need to work on themselves more. And I feel like there is a majority, perhaps, of the population in the West. Uh, I cannot comment on India. I'm just can't, uh, commenting on things that I've, uh, I have uh, observed. Now, having said that, I also hold uh, a different opinion in a sense that I don't believe that we should be outright like root or horrible just just because this is who we are i feel like a lot of things in the world can be achieved through the through the means of a kind word right and and can you see like how dichotomy works here like like you might be like you know say what you what you are because this is who you are but at, but two things can be said true at the same time you can say the truth even though it's not nice perhaps but you need to know also how to say the reason why i say need to know it is because i feel like bigger things can be achieved when you are meeting people where they are so if they are ready to achieve uh, uh, perceive your message in more sugar-coated way then that is the way to communicate with them that's just basics of understanding how communication works right there's nothing more or less but i still for example believe that it is about kindness now i'm a very direct person and i've lived in the uk for what 15 or so years and i had to learn the <laughs> english politeness and you know what i came to actually like it i don't I, I still don't think i still think i have a very long way to go till i'm like able to achieve that almost a state of untrusty when it comes to communication but at the same time i'm like you know what who i want to be is someone that communicates that way you know so it also is a personal choice because i feel like when when you are able to communicate in the and it, it doesn't mean that you're not telling the truth it's just knowing how to, to tell the truth so you know, um, that is kind of what I came to to realize for myself. And this is how I would ideally like to operate. But sometimes when I'm angry, I just say it as it is and I don't care, you know, and I have to work with that. Um, and yeah, it's all about evolving. It's about being aware of what's happening with you and how to evolve further. So gosh, I went on a really long round. Uh, in any case, I feel like I need to wrap this up because the video is going to be way too long. Um, I really enjoyed the video. I feel like the, the guy is super duper smart. Uh, I cannot wait what happens in a part two um, and uh, what we can learn uh, from the video and, and from the man itself. Uh, so thank you so, so much for watching this video with me. If you did enjoy it, please give a thumbs up, share, like, and subscribe to this channel. And I'll see you in a part two. Until then, please do take care. I'm sending much, much love. Bye-bye.